this out. Check this out. So I'm canceling it. I'm stopping it. Cease. Halt. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yes. The opinion has become the god of the audience. So is there a line then between anger is a part of your education and anti-dragon culture? Like what is... I just want you to say dragon culture one more time. Dragon culture. <laughs> <laughs> Annabelle creation? I'm swinging on anyone who was even a part of that because that was the scariest fucking movie. These are one of the only times where I'm happy that Hollywood is racist because it had... <laughs> Four white girls, a Latina nun, and it had a little black girl in the orphanage. So all these little girls in the orphanage, they live in this house, and Annabelle the doll is discovered and starts all these scary happenings. And it kept it real as fuck. The black girl barely had any lines. She popped up in like these little inopportune scenes. And then when the, when the haunt scenes happened, she kept it real as fuck, and she got the fuck out of it. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel. This is Jess Latasha, the ghetto dork, the hood spirit, and of course, broken bougie. Um, I am here to talk about episode five of Insecure, Hella Shook, which had me hella shook because Molly, I know we want to talk about Molly real quick because she did some wild shit, but I'm going to save her for last. And if you guys are new to my Insecure reviews, I don't go chronologically according to the episode. I actually break it down character by character. And since Molly want to act up, we got to save her for last, okay? And of course, if you guys haven't seen my little ad that I put in the front of this video, that is for my new podcast called Fuck It. It's a podcast. And you can find us everywhere, Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, iTunes, at Pod. I am joined by my co-worker and burgeoning friend, Miss Amanda Berry, and it's hilarious. So we really get to see Lawrence, first of all, going through it. Uh, he is not having a great time anymore. Uh, it's really hitting him that he is alone, he is away from Issa, and he's starting to long... Uh, for that connection again, specifically with her. Uh, sex is not fulfilling it, shallow conversations, hi Chad, and a, and a new Chad, hi, hello. Um, those are no longer cutting it. He's really starting to process and take time away from the outside influences. Lawrence is really getting to know and feel his inside feelings that he's been running from for so long. So this week we get to see him bond with his coworkers. I don't know why, but I feel like the two co-workers, the women, are attracted to him. They have such sexual energy, like when they talk to him, when they look at him, just anytime they're engaging with Lawrence. But he gets called into jury duty, so we really get to see him be alone and travel through this time where outside influences can't find him. And uh, social media will fuck you up. Social media will fuck you up. He's scrolling on Facebook. First of all, the details in this show never cease to blow my mind. Did you guys see, uh, as he's scrolling through his phone, there was an ad for Due North. Um, it is the show that Issa and everybody just happens to be watching um, every week. And it stars uh, Regina Hall, who's playing a slave, to, <laughs> to the guy who plays Jake in Scandal. Okay, so every time I saw Due North, I was like, this is such a Shonda Rhimes show. This is supposed to mimic the Shonda Rhimes drama and and over just the over dramatics and it felt like such a Shonda Rhimes show and why I'm talking about it now is because when he was scrolling to his Facebook it had the Due North ad which of course because Facebook is a genius at its target marketing <laughs> and Facebook knows all our business so it knows which shows we're watching and it says Thursdays at 9 8 central something like that nigga that's the time slot for scandal don't that, don't that show feel like scandal don't come in, don't come on my channel and lie to me today. That show never felt like scandal a little bit. Um, of course, another amazing performance by Natasha Rothwell, who plays Kelly, who's doing a hottest pepper in the world challenge and eats it. And Lawrence is like, what is she doing? She's making us laugh. So she was doing the pepper challenge. And as he's scrolling through, um, he catches through one of Kelly's photos that 
Issa out there with Daniel getting real canoodly. You know, social media will catch you out there sometimes. You may be in the background of somebody's picture. You ain't signing up for that picture. You was out there vibing. But you got got. Oh, how the tables have turned. <laughs> because you had my girl Issa in like episode two or episode three checking with Tasha's in Instagram and her Facebook. And now it's, now it's your turn. Oh, eat it up, Lawrence. Eat it up. These are the feelings. Feelings. The feelings that we feel. Also, another detail. Uh, Kelly's full name is Kelly Prenny. And if you guys didn't catch that, um, her last name is the combination of the show on his name, who was Prentice Penny. And I saw that right away because I was like looking up. Oh, I'm nosy. Shout out to um, the black woman who was trying to get out of jury duty uh, during the jury screening where they decide whether or not you are sane enough or appropriate enough to be a part of the jury duty for an upcoming case. Um, a black woman stood up and was like, I have a prejudice against the police instead of with the Black Lives Matter tea. And it, the black judge was like, sit down. That, nope, that ain't it. I mean, girl, at this point, if we're going to be real, we all against the police. So it ain't even that special enough. For you to get up out of jury duty with that reason but it was a nice nod for Issa and the creators of the show to be like we see you black lives matter like we know you exist we're shouting you out but in a very roundabout way like a not direct way where we have to pay attention to racism and police brutality and fixing the world and being black and it hurts they went they went a totally different angle to where we can feel at ease see and recognize black lives matter and continue to enjoy the show. They are so good. They're so good. So Lawrence's scene when he's uh, speaking to Derek was such an important part and a time for men. Like they really enjoyed the fact that two men have had that real conversation about um, their feelings and relationships. There's no more distractions. Lawrence is now, Lawrence is no longer out there having shallow sex. He's not hanging out with Chad who's not giving him space to really vent and really say how he feels, like he's just trying to big him up on a superficial level, who opens the door for Lawrence to share his true feelings. And it's super important, and Derek makes Lawrence accountable. I'm gonna show you how much of this is your fault. I know she cheated, I know it's terrible, I know you're not together, I know you feel bad. But you know what made her even want to look at another man who has these winning qualities because you sat on that bouch for two years with loser qualities and then you just weren't attractive for two years and so her eyes wandered and then unfortunately her body did as well take a set take some accountability lawrence and no you didn't deserve to be cheated on i mean shit but but and the last thing that we get with Lawrence, uh, he's really, he's sitting alone, he's in the dark, he is one step away from shower sliding, and he's scrolling on Facebook looking at Miss Issa D, her Facebook profile, and he is nowhere on it. <laughs> like, that's the gag for me, is that he is nowhere on it. He's watching her life continue without him, and he's just feeling all the feelings. Um, and I think, and I noticed, I checked, they're still friends. That friend box is still checked. I think saying, if you guys ended on that bad of a note, if you guys did not end in a good place, staying friends with your ex on social media is so unhealthy. You're always going to check in and you're not giving yourself that emotional distance to not see them and, and to just live outside of this, this bubble that is suddenly burst. It's terrible. He got to log off. He has to unfriend. He's got to log off. It's so unhealthy. And we get an original song collaborative by Bryson Tiller and Jasmine Sullivan called Insecure and they are just singing while Lawrence is feeling and it's so sad. I don't feel bad for him but it's sad. We're gonna go ahead and move on to Issa. Now me being of a certain tax bracket and a, uh, a lower pay grade um, Miss Broken Bougie herself, I totally know that moment when you're at the gas pump and you're trying to hit that exact number. Not 498, not 499, not 501, five. And you hitting that stutter pump, that, that right here, you checking that little penny going up. Ah, she, she not even going to the next dollar. She's just trying to get the most, 
for her penny. And then when that little gas drip at the end, you'd be mad because it hit the floor instead of inside your tank. When you pull it out, brrr. Issa's first move in this episode was to go see Daniel. She's obviously going somewhere. She's getting gas before she gets there. And she knocks on the door to go see Daniel. And this is unusual for me because we understand that Issa's in her whole phase and she doesn't want anything serious. But she's going to go see someone who she had a history with, who she has a past with, um, who she knows as a friend during the daytime. So they're smashing all day, and then when it's nightfall, Issa's peacing out. Like, listen, like, I gotta go. Like, you know, she's not gonna sleep over because that's the boundary that she set. But I already think she, this is already murky waters. Booty calls are specifically for a night, and you don't sleep over. Come on, maneuvers. Get out of there. You, like, you have to get out of there. And so the time of day that she chose to go see and hang out and be with Daniel versus the time that she leaves, I don't know. The lines are blurred here between them. Do North pops up again, y'all. <clears throat> Exponential detail, okay? Um, they're watching the slave show Do North and Regina Hall is, is saying to Massa, why are you connecting with your wife when you got me? Side chick territory. Um, and as a white man to a black woman, he goes, don't worry about her. She's taking care of the tree, but you get to trim the bush. And Regina gets so excited and starts working on them, that pan spell and tries to get to the dick. That is so Scandal. And I want you guys to understand something. We were rooting for Olivia and Scandal, but she was nothing more than a bed wench who could only have access to the president's dick. And he's like, I'll let you, I'll let you attend to the bush. Like he's doing her a favor. There are such parallels. And if you guys haven't noticed, when Issa is walking over to Daniel, you'll see a very blurred image in the background um, of Regina the slave and the white wife fighting over laundry. They're doing a tug of war on the screen, tugging, fighting. Yo, I can't with this show. So the next day, Issa goes to meet with Molly. Molly lets her know that she's leaving. She got to go back home to her parents' house for their vow renewal. Uh, and Issa has to stay in town because she has a work retreat. Um, so she can't go nowhere. Ladies know when that, that one guy that you wanted to text you, text you, and you glow up a little bit, you just get that little... <laughs> and so Molly checks it because she knows her girl. What's up with that? And then Issa tries... Oh, no, 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 no. It's not even, it's not even like that. She gonna keep blurring these lines and fronting about how she feels and where the feelings are and while still trying to maintain that hotation. And you ain't really got too many hoes if you can name them. I'm sorry, you don't. And I love the fact that Issa's really playing the field. She's dating a Latin man, so we get some interracial stuff going on. We get an older man. Nico was 46 years old on Tinder. He is single. He is hot. He is older. And um, Issa just wants to have fun. And, like, she's she's getting her footing back. She's not doing that awkward sexy walk anymore. She actually wore something sexy to the date um, to go meet this man. And she's she's feeling good. She's, she's, she's found her footing in this. However, Issa is selfish as fuck. She is so so selfish and I'm a little like taken aback like damn like she's cold so she texts Daniel in the beginning of her date in case her and Nico don't vibe and that don't go well and then when she sits down and has a great conversation maybe five minutes maybe five minutes and she's she finds out that she's feeling Nico and he is a possibility for the night she cancels Daniel and then when she finds out that Nico can't go home with her because he got to be up early for a flight or what have you and she ain't gonna get that Latin D she texts Daniel again. Issa, this is a person. You can't just yo-yo somebody back and forth to fit into your specific world and needs and wants and then just leave them hanging when you don't, you don't want to show up. Damn, this character is like terrible. Like she is a bad person. But it's so real because so many people use people like that into a very specific capacity and toss them and throw them away. Oh. Who said my name? Oh, 
but it's real and the fact that she's so flawed is why we continue to be so drawn to her and feel like we know her because she, these mistakes these flaws these wrong moves are all over the place and hanging at and that is real so daniel i really wonder like where his emotions are because though she didn't call him for help um she had to cancel this booty call second time of the night and end up telling him that he's that she's in a car accident didn't tell him why she got a dick pic but she tells him, listen, I just happened to get into some trouble. Here's why. And without even being asked, he comes to her rescue and he says the scariest thing in the world to someone who wants someone unattached. Don't worry, I got you. While in this long, beautiful night shadow embrace, we scared. Let's put our guard up. Let's put our blockers up. You got to go. You got to go. You got to go. And Issa, who I'm surprised, takes a very mature move and makes it verbally clear, very distinct communication. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We got to draw, we got to draw a line in the sand right here, and right now. We cool, but we ain't, we ain't going there with it. Let's just be, we're friends with benefits. You're seeing other people. I'm seeing other people. No pressure. Let's not get this thing into a more serious place. And I don't think Daniel's feeling that. And he's pretending that it is. Very Tasha, pretending to be okay, walking on them eggshells, just as long as you can get this much access to the person that you want. You're going to have to let it be good enough for you right now. Don't rock the boat. But Daniel, he's got to want more, right? Y'all think he wants more? For sure. Um, I think Issa Rae as a person and a creative is brilliant and beautiful. Issa D as a character is terrible, and I don't get it. Let's go into Issa's work life, where Frida, who I'm not feeling right now, me and Frida got beef. We really do got beef. Uh, we're seeing all the microaggressions by her racist white coworkers that she has to deal with every day. How racist are they? So racist that they do a shout out to Betsy DeVos as a leader in education for children. Because that's wrong. Betsy DeVos is widely known for being a terrible worker for education for children, especially in inner city youths, black and brown kids. Um, she is famously known for removing prominent school programs that help with education for children, even removing programs that assist with school lunches to provide food for children. And she's terrible. She literally shows up to public schools and gets booed by the kids themselves. She's terrible. So the fact that these characters are praising her shows how disconnected they are from what they're even doing here. This is a program that's supposed to help inner city youth and they have no clue. So during this work retreat, uh, Issa's boss put, poses a question to the coworkers. If there is a child who is usually in a positive, bright mood, all of a sudden starts coming in and is in a, de is in a negative and dark place, how do you think we can do an outreach to this this kid or how do you think we can help or what do you think is the problem and so we really see these covert ways of racism coming out these co-workers the white co-workers start projecting on this presumably black child i would think that the kid is pregnant or uh, i would think that their parents are attached to an organization which That line is pretty big because we have kids of Black Panther parents. We had kids of Black Lives Matter parents. And when they have to go out into the world, a world that's supposed to cater to them and give them service, do these teachers take out their, their microaggressions on these students? Well, your Black parent doesn't like Trump, or your Black parent is going against the police, the good police in this town. And how are they going to take that on the children who need to learn from them. Shit, fuck me up. And then the last white coworker says, I would just think that something in their home life changed, which to me, that's honestly was my first thought. I would think that, you know, children go through experiences, they internalize, and then they bring that, that energy to school and their, and their newly social lives. And they don't know how to process, they don't know how to communicate, they don't know how to deal. Um, so I would definitely have thought that um, something in their home life would change. But Issa D makes a good point and she says, we should probably just fucking ask. Issa one, us zero. 
So in this scene, as Insecure has proven time and time again that their wardrobe is a pinpoint towards telling that story further. Uh, Issa is wearing a Public Enemy team. If you guys don't know Public Enemy, I mean, original hip-hop group, late 80s, early 90s, where hip-hop was burgeoning because black people needed a voice for all of the racist, oppressive forces. And so one of their major songs, Fight the Power, Fight the Power against police brutality, against damaging governments, against the crack epidemic provided by our president. Um, Public Enemy was a poignant voice in hip hop on behalf of oppression against black people. And so she's wearing this Public Enemy tee to this racist work retreat and it really is a voice to combating the overt racism that happens against black people where you have to fight the power versus the covert racism that happens to black people where you have good white people who are supposed to be protecting and giving to black children who are still projecting racism and probably doing just as much harm. Those layers right there, like, damn. So Frida is still mad at Issa. Um, she's super upset because Issa will not go ahead and talk to Principal Gaines, the, the racist black principal who's taking his racism out on Latino kids. And we get into like a really good crux of a conversation here because Issa says, which I've been wanting her to say kind of like from last episode, that black people can't be racist. Like black people can't be racist. And Frida's smart ass is going to go ahead and say, well, it's having the power to manipulate a group of people, isn't it? Oh, so you're just going to be literal? Don't tell me the definition of racism and acting like, you know... Because you know, I mean, you know, but don't be giving us the literal definition as if you're like, you just see, no. Cause now, see now me and Frida really got a problem. No, black people can't be racist. And I still agree with Issa that black people can't be racist because this is one person, yes, using his power to manipulate the group of Latino kids. Yeah, sure. But where I think it's racism though, is when the group of a colored people affect or manipulate a group of another colored people. Not one person doing a bad thing in a school. And if white people didn't show him what racism was and how to manipulate their power against a group of colored people, then Principal Gaines wouldn't have felt that he needs to exert his power as a black man who has limited power elsewhere and, and tries to assign with whiteness or republicanism or Trumpism or whatever it may be. He wouldn't even know how to do that if y'all didn't do it first. And so now he's going to take the little power that he has to try to gain power over somebody else, which doesn't even really matter. Because guess what? If and when Principal Gaines gets fired or loses his job, or breaks a leg, or does something, his racism stops. Racism is a whole system, not one person with an attitude. Try me again, Frida. I'm swinging next time. And this is exactly why woke white bothers me. I'm moving on. Let's get to Molly, my girl. <laughs> so we get to see Molly in the location of the Shy town office. Um, the lawyer firm with uh, Lil Rel. I'm forgetting his character name. It's Lil Rel. Um, and there's so many black people in this office that Molly can't even remember who's who. Usually in big cities, maybe New York, LA, somewhere like that, you know the one black person because you have to. Lil Rel really encourages Molly to explore your boundaries. So many times we as people just get stuck in a routine or how things are supposed to be or we get comfortable where we at and we really don't even explore or think that we can still change something up, get something better. Complaining is so easy, check your challenge. Lil Rao has a huge office and he still works under that white lady who transferred from Molly's office from before. He has a huge office. Molly's office is beautiful, it's all glass, everything, but it's a cubicle, it's still a cubicle. This dude is out here with a couch, a bookshelf that's like at least six feet away from his own desk, all the windows, all the windows, he got space. This is this could be a good look for Molly. So, it look, it's looking like some opportunities is waiting for. Also, interjection, I think I overshot it with Molly. Um, I don't know if she's really carrying around this, this big hidden pain 
um, that's showing up in her love life or, or making her guarded with her therapist and, and her friends. Um, she may just be a private ass person. So I, I remembered her discussion with the therapist saying that her brothers are all over the place. Um, so the apple don't fall far from the tree. If her brothers are all over the place, most likely she's all over the place. So I think maybe it was just to show um, Molly's delusion in how she regards herself and how she sees herself. She thinks she's got it all together when really she's just as messy as everyone else. So Molly arrives first thing in the morning to help her parents uh, start decorating for their big vow renewal ceremony the next day. Uh, so she's unpacking from her car and of course, Joe grew up in the house across the street so he's already there. Looking fine as fuck, early in the morning, like, he's not low. He wanted Molly to look and check him out. He made sure to wear his finest gold chain. <laughs> That American Apparel tight tee, that extra medium size with the little little booty hanging out the denim. Like, he knew what he was looking like. He knew what he was going for when he went to go see Molly. And this is why she played him like, <laughs> tight tee. <laughs> like, she's me. Um, I get that the writers are trying to make us know that Dro, Alejandro, and Molly go way back. I wish we could see that in a different way other than remember when you used to do 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 Yeah, and remember when you used to do 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 For me, right now in this episode, we did a lot of that in the last episode in the club at Kiss and Grind. It's fall the dialogue is falling real flat with this right now. Um, the whole remember when. If we can get like a little flashback, if we can get like a... Even just maybe like an object that, that shows something of the past, if we can get something different in there. This whole remember when I could, we need to we need something deeper than that at this point. <laughs> Me giving advice to writers of insecure. <laughs> so Drew is really putting the pressure on Molly again to be like, listen, I remember I remember what I said to you at Kiss and Grind. Wasn't drunk. Is there something here? You never saw me like that. Like I really want to know if you're get into me. I really need to know. And Molly's just shooting him down like this is just not going to work. And this makes me confused because this doesn't feel like just sex. And if it's not just sex with Drew's open marriage, then he's cheating. Because now you're, you and Molly are emotionally connected. Why would you want her to like you so much? Why would you want her to choose you? Why do you need, you doing all this for Molly's ass specifically? You want, you want to sleep with Molly so bad specifically? That's not making too much sense. So Molly is really at this point chasing a, an image of perfection that only exists in her mind of her parents' marriage. They've been married for 35 years. They love each other so much. And she has this image of perfection. Um, and so she questions, you know, maybe I should settle. I did find the perfect guy. We went out. I wasn't quite feeling him, but maybe I will. Or maybe I should just choose him because he's got everything on my list except my heart or me liking him at all. Um, so let me bring him around, let me try again, let me just try to make it work, try to make it fit. And her brother's like, what are you doing? If you don't like him, why is he here? And she has someone real for a second just interject who knows her and wants the best for her without wanting anything from her. And so when she faces the fact that this perfect guy is not going to be perfect for her, another image of her idea of perfection is shattered when she learns that her father cheated on her mother. Oh, and this girl goes into a tirade, a huge, huge, huge tirade. And I think really this is projection because what I think Molly is asking here is if my parents ain't even got their shit together, if the two people, the only couple that I saw actually make it work for all this time and gave me the idea of what love means, if that wasn't real, what chance do I have to find literally anyone for myself because none of these niggas out here are working? And I think that anger, of course, it was at her father for hurting her mother and, and being a, a vision of lie to her. But it was also just an internalization of if my mom can't do this thing, I surely have no chance. And that is what really hurts her. That's really what hits the heart of it for her. And also she questions her mom. What kind of woman is her mom to stay with an adulterer, to, to put up with someone who's put her through that kind of pain. Mama gotta make a lemonade. Come out with the lemonade, mama, we wanna hear it. Write a poem or something, a haiku. Come on, mama, just get the pain out, we wanna hear it. So Molly storms out. This is getting dramatic. She's so hurt, she runs into the night 
And we really have a moment here where who's it going to be? Is it going to be Lionel, who should be the perfect guy for Molly? Or is it going to be Jiro, who been there for Molly, but he's in a situation? A marriage. He, I, I really underplayed that. He's married. That's a pretty big deal. Um, Lionel backs off. For, to be honest, he don't even know her like that. He don't know what she like. He don't. She don't even know where he work. He, they're not. They don't really know each other, and they're just trying to do this thing, and they're trying to front about it. Um, and he's like, "You got it, bruh. You got it." Like, why does he even have to deal with Molly at this point? It's been too hard. It's been too forced, and it's been too hard. This is the moment we got to break away. So Drew goes after his homegirl, and they're just vibing and talking, and she just gets to vent. <sighs> I'm gonna stop it here because it's getting too hot, right? It's getting way too hot. Let's go and stop it right here. I wanna shout out the fact that we get to see an Afro Latino. This is Alejandro. And we get to see Alejandro's Latin father and his black mama who gets to make him and his tall, beautiful, goofy looking, hot perfection. He is so, whew, he fine. Draw was fine. Um, we hear black people speaking Spanish and Molly speaks Spanish. I told y'all Molly is me. Mala está mi amiga mejor en mi cabeza. Está... Yo conozco habla español también. Y Mali sabe habla español también. Mali está mi, mi está Mali. I really be speaking Spanish out here when I say... Somebody been spying on me. I bet it's Facebook. Facebook been selling my information to Insecure named May Molly. So Dro was present. Molly's going through it. He's taking her back to her classy room up in the sky hotel that she can afford. Good for her. I wish that part of Molly was me. <laughs> and then just the tension is building. I find it really ironic that she doesn't even think to call Issa. These are supposed to be best friends. They always vent to each other. They always tell each other their problems. She don't call Issa at all. And I mean, maybe it's just a situation. She just wants to get out of there. She's flustered. She's emotional. Um, but she lets Dro take up that space. And Dro's taking up that space. And they get to the door. And Dro does this thing that, that this guy, he knows how to do. He's so intense looking at Molly with them eyes that just say, I dare you. But it also says, like, let me, like, let me. Oh. And it's so much tension at that door. And we see Molly leave like it's just not going to happen. But then she comes back because she knows what it is. And she's like, I'm going to get the deed that I deserve. And Alejandro is up there just giving her all that good upstairs and just letting it act. And it happened. And it happened. And what a satisfying ending. So satisfying. Uh, and it sets us up as an audience for us to just dive more messy. Messy irk. If she said no, it'd be over and we have to start a new story. No. Dive in. Go on, come on, writers. Yes. Um, low key, no shade. Dro got weak strokes. Okay. The butt wasn't moving right. The butt was not moving correctly. Um, it looks sloppy. And I'm glad that the curiosity has been satisfied because as a woman, you want to know what the stroke game is like. You just get real curious. And the fact that I saw that it was messy. Now I know, and I could put that, that dream to bed. And to be TBH, it's one of my biggest fears. To lust after a guy for so long, he's so hot, and I have all this tension, all this passion rising, and then it happens, and it's whack. Now you owe me. I did you a favor. <laughs> okay, so that was my review for Insecure, episode five, Hella Shook, let me know what you think. Please turn on your notifications so you guys can know when I upload new videos, leave comments. It helps me so much as a creator providing all this content for you guys. Um, of course, I enjoy this, but YouTube seeing your engagement with me and my videos helps me as a creator. So please give it a thumbs up. Let me know all of your thoughts. Let's talk about Insecure, and I will see you guys next time with a new video. Peace out.